please join me in the Christian greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. The Advent candle this morning will be lit by Tim and I. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope, remembering the hope which comes in Christ. Today, we light the second candle of Advent, the candle of peace. God has a peaceful dream for the world, and we dream it too. We dream of a peaceful world full of wolves and leopards and lions eating and sleeping and dancing with the lambs, kids, and calves. We dream of a peaceful world where nations come together, where war is a memory, and we eat at one table. On we this light this candle in peace. On this day, day, we remember the Lord of all, who brings peace surpassing all understanding. A voice cries in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make God's way clear. Lift up every valley, lower every mountain. For the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. Our hymn of praise this morning is Break Forth of Bounteous Heavenly Light.
does not want anyone to perish, but rather for all to come to repentance. Therefore, let us confess our sins, for God's salvation is at hand. Faithful God, we confess that we have not lived in holiness. We suffer from impatience, apathy, and grief. We have not been at peace. Let us conclude our prayer of confession together. We repent of these offenses and turn to you in love. Forgive our iniquity and pardon our sins that we may walk in righteousness to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, by the mercy of Christ, your sins are forgiven, for salvation is at hand for all who turn to God. Thanks be to God. Faithful 
goodness brings forth from the earth, but righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield to sorrows. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps. appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, Riley. Your 
of the decisions every good storyteller has to make is when to tell the story secret. Every story has a secret, and the spinner of tales has to decide whether to let them know about the secret early in the story or to surprise them with it at the end. Mystery writers have a tendency to hold back the secret to the last chapter, keeping you eagerly turning the pages to discover who really poisoned the heiress or pushed Colonel Whittington down the elevator shaft. The same is true of soap operas. Will Melita find true happiness with Jason the soap? Chauffeur, the old radio announces what in tone. Tune in tomorrow for the next episode of The Bright Horizon. In other words, turn the next page, tune in tomorrow, and you will learn the secret. There are other stories, however, in which the storyteller reveals the secret at the beginning. We know the secret even before some of the characters do, and we watch them gradually discover the hidden truth we already possess. Oh, Grandma, what big eyes you have, trilled the innocent little Red Riding Hood. But we already know, do we not, that the secret of what ravenish destruction lies, bonnet clod, under those covers. Or in another children's tale, the ugly duckling, shunned because of his homeliness, finally emerges as the lovely swan we know him to be all along. In Princeton, New Jersey, there is a legendary tale about the eminent scientist, Albert Einstein. He was walking in front of a local inn and being mistaken for a bellboy by an older woman who had just arrived in a luxury sedan. She ordered him to carry her baggage into the hotel. And according to the story, Einstein did it. She received, he receives a teeny weeny tip and then continues on his way to his office at Princeton University to ponder the mysteries of the universe. True or not, the story is delightful precisely because we save her from the beginning, a secret the older woman did not know. The strange-looking, ruffled man is the most deliberate, celebrated intellect of the time. Some stories gain their power from our knowing the story's secret from the start. The Gospel of Mark is just such a story. Mark is the only gospel that has no nativity story in it. It starts right off saying who Jesus is the Son of God. In the very first sentence of the Gospel story, Mark lifts the veil and lets us know the secret of when he says that this is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. That is the secret. And least we forget this hidden truth is confirmed in the story's opening episode, when Jesus, coming up out of the waters of baptism, sees the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove from the heavens, which had been torn open like a piece of cloth, and hears the very voice of God telling the secret, Thou art my beloved Son, with thee I am well pleased. In Mark, only Jesus sees the Spirit. Only Jesus hears the voice. This is, in the words of one commentary, a secret epiphany. God knows the secret. Now Jesus knows the secret. And because Mark has let us in on it, we know the secret too. Jesus is the Son of God. And now we watch with amazement as the story unfolds because almost no one else seems to be able to discover the secret. The authorities mistake Jesus for a troublemaker. The people confuse him with the prophet Elijah, among others. Even his disciples are 
blind to the full truth of who he is. Ironically, in the middle of the story, only the demons he has come to destroy recognize the secret that Jesus is the Son of God. The thing is, he does not look like a son of God, like the genius Einstein dragging the heavy suitcase of a wealthy woman up the stairs of a hotel. Jesus does not look like who he really is. That is part of the secret, and it stays hidden because of that. Why doesn't Jesus look like the Son of God? Because he suffers, and that seems unlikely in God's own Son. Jesus is the suffering Son of God, and that is a hard secret to learn. Once the disciples came very near to discovering the secret. Who do you say that I am? Jesus asked them. Peter stepped forward to answer, you are the Christ. Does Peter know the secret? No, because Jesus immediately began to tell them the whole secret, that he faced suffering, rejection, and death. And Peter rebuked Christ. Peter does not really understand the secret. Jesus is the suffering Son of God, and that's a hard secret to learn. That is why Mark tells us the secret in the beginning. He wants us to know that Jesus is the Son of God when all hell breaks loose on Golgotha. No reasonable person who takes one look at this pitiable Galilean dragging the, the image, luggage of the world's scorn up the steps of Calvary would say, this is the Son of God. But Mark wants us to remember the secret when the most devout people of his day spit in Christ's face and call him blasphemer. Mark wants us to remember the secret. When the Roman soldiers turn his trial into a fraternity party, dressing him in a purple blanket and a crown of thorns, holding their sides with cruel laughter as they knelt before him in mock respect. Mark wants us to remember the secret. When they drove the spikes into his flesh and taunted him to come down from the cross, Mark wants us to remember the secret. There at the end, with the sky murderously dark, the air filled with Jesus' death cry and the temple curtain torn in two, Mark wants us to remember that earlier day when the skies, like the temple curtain, were also torn in two, and a voice spoke from heaven. Mark wants us to hear the centurion at the foot of the cross, confessing the secret we have known from the beginning. Truly, this man was the Son of God. Appearance and reality, that is the meaning of Mark's secret. The one who appeared to be rejected is in reality the one in whom God is well pleased. The one who appeared to be deserted by all is in reality is the beloved son. The one who appeared in petitent death is the one in whose power all shall live. That is the secret revealed in the baptism of Jesus. And it is the secret in which all Christians share through baptism. <coughs> In Flannery Connor's story, The River, a woman named Mrs. Connor, who has been employed for the day to take care of the son of some wealthy and uncaring parents, takes the boy to a riverside baptismal ceremony, being led by a pastor named Bevel Summers. Standing on the bank of the river, they hear Summers warning the crowd that if they have come for an easy miracle, to leave their pain in the river. They have come for the wrong reason. There ain't but one river, and that's the river of life made of Jesus' blood, he said. It's a river of pain itself to be washed away. Slow, you people, slow. Suddenly, Mrs. Conan lifted the boy up in the air and asked the preacher to pray for the boy's mother who had been ill. 
Mrs. Conan tells Summers that she suspects the boy had never been baptized. And Summers commands her to bring the boy to him. Summers asks the boy if he wanted to be baptized. When the boy says yes, Summers responds, you won't be the same again. You will count. Appearance and reality in the baptism of Jesus, the secret of his identity is revealed, and nothing that appears thereafter, not even the spit in the nails of Golgotha, can take that reality away. In our baptism, the secret of our identity is revealed. You are a child of God. You won't be the same again. You will count. Nothing that appears thereafter can take that reality away. For in Christ Jesus, writes Paul in Galatians, you are all children of God through faith. For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That is the character in John Steinbeck's book, Sweet Tuesday, Thursday, a PhD from the University of the Chicago Doc earns his living selling marine specimens he has collected from the tidal pool near his home. He has a good life, but when he reflects deeply, Doc is troubled by the nagging sense of discontent. Have I worked enough? Have I eaten enough? Have I loved enough? What has my life meant so far? And what can it mean in the time left to me? What have I contributed? To the great ledger. What am I worth? What am I worth? For many, life folds day after day with the question unanswered, and the verdict is suspended. Have I worked enough? Have I loved enough? What am I worth? The secret remains hidden to the end, the truth never really known. When I considered the briefness of my life, mused Pascal, swallowed up before and behind it, a small space I fill, or even see, engulfed in the infinite immensity of spaces, which I know not, and which know not me, I'm afraid. Who has set me here? By whose order and arrangements have this place and time been allotted to me. For many, the secret remains concealed. Who am I? Why am I here? What am I worth? I am afraid. The baptism is secret is out at the beginning. The truth is known at the inception, and there is no need to fear, come what may. You all are my beloved child, my very own. I have placed you here and called you to be my own. In you, I delight. In his autobiographical book, Creative Dislocations, Robert McAfee Brown remembered the day in 1960 when he participated in a Lutheran worship service in East Berlin only a short time before the Berlin Wall was constructed. There were not many people present. The church attendance was viewed with suspicion by the state. The German, East German Republic had developed secular alternatives to replace all of the rituals of the church. Nonetheless, a young couple there in the service was presenting their child for baptism, and Brown was amazed. Why, he wondered, would they jeopardize their future and that of their child by insisting on this ancient ritual of baptism when a secular alternative was readily and painlessly available? Brown wrote, the couple does not have to answer my question. Their very act of bringing the child to the church is a public statement of their priorities. They engage in significant risk because of their faith. In the face of their quiet, public courage, I feel unworthy. The couple knew a sick 
secret about their child, which no secular tyranny could take away. This is a child of God, baptized in the very name of the one whose secret we have always known. Surely, this is the Son of God. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response is Comfort, Comfort, You My People. Let us stand. which is found in your bulletin. Let us affirm our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. As heralds of God's good tidings, let us lift up our voices with strength this day, praying to the one who comforts, restores, and heals. 
let us pray for our church. You have given us the gift of the Messiah so that your church may be steadfast and true. Give us strength to follow our son, your son, until all have come to repentance and are reconciled with his law. Let us pray for those who are sick or need our prayers. Louise, Dale, Mary, Tammy, Cindy, Nora Lou, Jan, Margaret, Chris, Zhou, Gail's nephew, Bobby, Garrett, Kelly, Sharon, Alan, Mark, John, Gail's friend Holly, Phil Reed, his daughter Paula, Becky, Tim and Lou's daughter Michelle and son Michael, as well as Lou's friends Anita and Debbie, and Lou's cousin Eric, Peggy, Becky's son-in-law's mother Dolly, and a friend Chris. who is seriously burned, Ryan's grandmother, Claire's husband, Carl, Gail and Bill, Jack and Jill, Bruce, Doogie's friend, David, Lila's friend, Mrs. Cam Mrs. Campbell, Keith, and her sister, Elizabeth, also all those who suffer needs, who are exiled or in danger. You have made us for the holy purpose to comfort and care for each other. Give us compassion to love our neighbor and patience to care for those in need. Let us remember those who have died. Everlasting God, one day in your presence is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. Make us one with the saints who have found their eternal home in you. Let us now pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. go before God and prepare a pathway for the Lord. Let us offer our lives and labor to God and fulfill our vows to the Most High.
prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that in the coming of Christ, your steadfast love and faithfulness have met and your righteousness and peace have kissed. May the gifts we offer this day lift up those in need and prepare the way of your salvation. Amen. Our sending him is come thou long expected Jesus. is coming. Therefore, strive to live in peace, for God's salvation is near. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit shall be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.